Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Healthy Living with Emerson Hospital. I'm Leah Lesser, Public Relations Manager at Emerson. Today we are very excited to welcome Dr. Ishida Bakshi, our Chair of Pediatrics. In addition to serving as Chair, she is a community pediatrician who has her own practice seeing children at Walden Pond Pediatrics just over in Concord. She is board certified in pediatrics and she obtained her medical degree from the University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine. Between 2008 and 2012, Dr. Bakshi served as a pediatrician in the U.S. Army while stationed in Germany. She also did a deployment in Afghanistan. And now, let's learn from Dr. Bakshi about lots of interesting topics, including tips to help prepare children and families for back to school, because that is coming up soon. Dr. Bakshi, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh. We're really excited to have you. Of course, it was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Dr. Bakshi, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am a daughter of two immigrants, um, a wife, an Army veteran, a mother of two amazing boys, and a general pediatrician who loves what she does. Um, I also more recently have had the opportunity to um, have the role of the Emerson Hospital Pediatric uh, Department Chair. Um, and with that, I get to guide the services of the pediatrics department, but I also have the opportunity to sit on different committees that are vital to the Emerson Hospital community. Um, I see a different side of the medicine uh, in our community, and I also still get to do what I love to do, which is to see my patients in the office. That's so fascinating. So not only do you practice medicine with young patients, but you also help inform practices at Emerson yes. with young ones. Yes. It's, it's a great experience. So it sounds like you have your hand in everything having to do with pediatrics at Emerson. I try, but I can still also have my hand back at the office, which is really what's important to me as well. That's terrific. And how old are your little boys? Uh, my eldest is seven, and my little one is three. That must come in handy as a pediatrician. Most definitely. I find <laughs> often that I use what I've experienced when I'm talking to my families. And I think that they appreciate that. I can imagine they do. So why did you want to become a pediatrician? Honestly, I always knew, I don't know why, but I always knew I wanted to be a physician. Um, becoming a pediatrician is something that I realized as a medical student doing my rotations. I just felt I was more natural with my patients and their families even. Um, and I had fun. I was like, you can't beat that. That's great. So your patients make you laugh on occasion, oh, I would imagine. They make me laugh. <laughs> we share stories. I sometimes even sometimes go off tangent of what the purpose of the visit is and then got to get real back in, but it's fun. That's great. Good. So what are some new things that families can expect when their child is treated at Emerson? Um, I think that there are a lot of families out there who have experienced Emerson having to do with bringing their child to the emergency department or for some special surgeries. Um, can you share a little bit about that? Sure, definitely. So at the hospital itself, we've got a great pediatric uh, inpatient unit. And on that unit are trained pediatric nurses as well as pediatric specific equipment. Um, our pediatric intervention team, which I can share a little bit more about you with, they are actually also housed on that same floor. Um, so that's really helpful. And um, there are volunteers who make age-appropriate blankets for the children who have to stay at the hospital, and then they get to take those blankets home. Um, the pediatric intervention team is a small team of individuals who works to help your child feel comfortable with their hospital experience, because unfortunately it's not always going to be a happy reason for why they're coming. It may be an illness or an injury that they're seeking care in the emergency department, or even a planned surgical procedure. Um, the PIT, which is what they're known as um, in terms of the mnemonic, um, they have age-appropriate coping kits. And in there, there are little bags um, with toys, books, to help them feel comfortable, um, to help distract them as well. 
um, and they find it very helpful. And families also are appreciative of it. That's so interesting. I had seen some children blowing some bubbles recently mm -hmm. using their coping kits, and, right. and the coping kit bag had some bubbles in them. Can you talk a little bit about why bubbles? Why would those be useful in a pediatric hospital type of environment? Sure. First of all, kids love bubbles. That's an, such an easy distraction, um, and it helps them focus on something different than what they're there for. And it also helps them to relax their breathing, which can help the physician or the nurse listen to their heart and their lungs appropriately without having any um, crying or fussing because they don't want to be touched, and they're just distracted with the bubbles. I see. So in the coping kits are really purpose-specific yes. toys that the children see as toys, but also they help the physicians and the nurses work with the children and diagnose and treat them. Yes, definitely. That's so fascinating. Yeah, I think it's a great uh, tool that they have. I do too. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about um, radiology at Emerson as it relates to children. I've heard the term image gently. Can yes. you talk a little bit about what that means? Sure. So that really just means that we use the lowest possible dose of radiation, okay. but to still be effective in the imaging, um, which is great because as parents, we want to avoid any risks for our children, but yet we still want to make sure that we can diagnose what's going on. Sure. And so they can feel comfortable with knowing that Emerson Hospital has low dose radiation for pediatric patients. Okay, great. And so I believe, um, of course, at the hospital, we have lots of different imaging uh, services, ready, uh, x-rays and CAT scans, et cetera. Uh, I think we have those in Westford, in our Westford location yes, as well? Yes, we do have satellite locations in a sense where you can have imaging. But we also have other things at other locations, um, like rehab, for example, is at both Concord and at Westford. Um, so it gives families the opportunity to not only come to one location, and it also has more availability for families. Um, another great okay. program that I think we have is a scoliosis program. Huh. Um, and what's really amazing about that is it brings everybody under one roof. Hmm. So you've got your orthopedic surgeon, you've got your um, brace team, you have your imaging also, as well as the physical therapist who does specifically Schroth technique um, for huh. patients with scoliosis, and they're all under one roof. So it's convenient um, for the families, which is a plus, and it's also really uh, focusing and showing you the importance of teamwork because you're all there and you can talk to each other at the same time and be able to come up with a plan together for the family. That sounds like such an easier way to work with children who have scoliosis. Definitely. Having everything under one roof in a convenient location in Westford. And um, I would imagine that clinicians are constantly talking with each other about um, their patients. And that does that help with, um, with the official outcome? Yes, I think the it does. The ultimate outcome? I think it definitely does because you're not having to go from one spot to another and then see if the physical therapist spoke with the surgeon, do they know what the next steps are, and you're waiting for a phone call back, but everything is right there and done. Great, making it easier for families, that's great. Most definitely. Good. So, understanding that there is no typical day in the life of <laughs> any physician, and particularly I would imagine a pediatrician, can you walk us through what a day in your life might look like? Sure. Um, well, a day in my life as a pediatrician actually starts after my own drop-offs. So once I get my own kids off, um, I drive into work, I may follow up a phone call from a family from the prior evening, try to reach out to a specialist before I get into the office, and then roll into the door and ready to start seeing patients. Um, possibly in between, of course, because some things can happen. Um, so I may get a call that I have to take, which may put me back a little bit to see the next patient, but all that has to get done, mm -hmm. and our families understand that. Um, depending on what day of the week it is, I may have a meeting at the hospital, so I'll get to step out for a little bit mm -hmm. um, and meet my colleagues at the hospital and touch base on what's going on and then return back for afternoon patients. Um, if I don't have a meeting, I may step away to see a baby at the hospital because I do have mm -hmm. that um, luxury, which I think is amazing. I love my newborns. Mm -hmm. um, so I usually, if I have a baby who um, is new to the practice, then I'll usually go out during my lunchtime and go see them and do daily visits with them until they're discharged. Nice. And then come back in the afternoon and finish off our day. Um, when once the last patient leaves, I'm still there, um, either tapping away on some more charts or reaching out to families, calling them back if I wasn't able to speak with them earlier in the afternoon. Hmm. 
So you have a dynamic, dynamic life. <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do, <laughs> and I love it. So, so you had mentioned that you love your babies, and I, I love that. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, Emerson's recent uh, baby-friendly designation? Of sure. So we achieved that designation in December of 2016, um, and it's a, a global program from the World Health Organization and the United Nations Children's Fund, hmm. which um, together with their help, our staff has been able to initiate and hopefully successfully help a family complete breastfeeding and if a family chooses not to then to show them the safe methods of formula feeding. Okay. Um, so we are definitely a baby friendly hospital um, and our patients are better for it. It's exciting. So you practice in Concord mm -hmm. and you live in the area. What is it like to both practice and live in the same community? No, at first I thought it would not be so nice in a sense. I wasn't sure how I felt about that because I had never had that pre experience before. I was sure. always living pretty far from where I worked. Um, but actually it's been really eye-opening um, and it's actually been kind of fun. I like running into my family sometimes, um, you know, at the grocery store even mm -hmm. um, or at a restaurant. Um, and for the sake of their privacy though, I will not reach out to them. I will not call out their name, but I definitely sure. will not ignore them. If they recognize me, I'll give a wave and we'll chat. If I'm with my family, I'll introduce um, and it's, I feel more a part of the community, mm -hmm. um, which I think is really important as a pediatrician to not only just see them in the office, um, but also I see what they do out there. And right. so I feel like I'm more a part of their lives in a sense. Sure. And I would imagine you're experiencing the school systems mm -hmm. and will be even more as your little guy gets yes. a little older. Definitely. Yes. That's great. Good. So speaking of school systems, it's getting to be back oh, to no. school season. It is. It's so sad. <laughs> and uh, I realize some children tuning in to this uh, show may not fully embrace this topic of back to school, but it is coming up to reality. Mm. Um, what are some of your best tips for preparing children for starting kindergarten or grade school for the first time? Sure. So if they were in a preschool system or a daycare prior, um, the biggest thing is going to be routine. And so they're already familiar with a routine. Um, for those who are not in any type of daycare system or preschool prior, just introducing a little bit of a routine, reading books about what kindergarten is going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, one book that I had read to my son is called Kindergarten, Here We Come. It's mm -hmm. from Scholastic. It's very short, um, very personal. It's got great pictures, and it tells a story about, you know, there's art, and there's also snack, and there's recess. Um, so it just gets them used to what they're going to do. I also would encourage, it's not just about the children getting used to it, but the parents, because mm -hmm. it may be a different um, lifestyle in a sense for them. Their morning sure. routine may be different. Mm -hmm. Their afternoon routine is going to have to be adjusted. So it's something that us as parents have to also be comfortable with. So I would encourage our families to attend any and all kindergarten activities that are being done in the summer. Uh, many of our local schools will have some type of orientation or a plague date in a sense for all the kindergartners to get together. Um, I know that idea. our local community had had that and we went to them. Um, so then the children feel comfortable with even just the playground. Mm -hmm. And if you have the opportunity to where your child can walk the halls, possibly see their classroom, mm. if they have a locker, understand what that's about. Um, and even either it's a um, walk to their bus stop or if you have to drive down to the bus stop, do it, point it out to them mm -hmm. um, that, hey, this is what we're going to be doing just so they feel comfortable and you do too. Right. Get them used to the upcoming exactly. new routines. Definitely. Great. Yeah. Great tips. Good. And so how about middle schoolers? Yeah. Best tips for helping them get back to school in healthy ways? Yeah. So there's a lot of things here, but what I'd like to focus on um, would be um, sleep really. Ah, uh, yes. Sleep and screen um, are actually big things <laughs> that come up. Sleep and screen. <laughs> they come up very often, um, even in our well visits. Um, so mm -hmm. ideally, it is best for them to have anywhere from 9 to 11 hours of sleep. Um, so trying to get to bed earlier for maybe the last week or so before school starts, mm -hmm. get used to that. Um, I know they're not going to like that I said that, but mm -hmm. I think it would be helpful for Ease all in the in. long run. Exactly. <laughs> um, and then 
you know, it says a lot about what we used to do with them when they were babies. You know, we had a specific bedtime routine and mm -hmm. we did this every single night. Um, there were no screens at that point, I know. Mm -hmm. um, so get them into a bedtime routine that they're comfortable with when it comes to their um, school bedtime routine. Um, and I think that will help a lot because if they have a good night's rest, they're going to be up and ready to go in the morning. Maybe mm -hmm. a little bit begrudgingly, but still they'll be ready to go and ready to um, take in all that education when they get to school. Right. Yeah. Ready to learn. Good. And then finally our high schoolers. Mm -hmm. Any tips for them having to do with sleep habits or screens yeah. or managing so stress? For them, a lot of what I said about the middle schoolers also applies. Um, for the high school kids as well. Sleep is also important. Mm -hmm. um, what we may see that we're struggling with a little bit more with our high schoolers is the combination of screen um, outside of what they need for school, mm -hmm. as well as their activities, trying to juggle that and get them a good night's rest. So just planning ahead when it comes to what kind of activities they're going to be doing, just think about what time is that going to put them in for bed and what mm -hmm. time do they have to get up all right, well, if that's the case, let's try to cut down screen about an hour beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that they're going to engage in screen. That's just, that's the life that we live now. Mm -hmm. And it's, we're out of that stage where um, it was just the computer or it was just the television. We've got right. a lot of other forms of screen. Um, so rather than the American County Pediatrics previously had said two hours, no more. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit difficult to say that now. So now what they're really advising is be engaged with your children, with what they're doing on the screen, mm -hmm. help guide them to things that are appropriate. Understand that they may be in social media and that's okay, but be a part of it. Ask them, what are you doing? And, and ask them to teach you and be willing to hear what they're doing out there and also teaching them safe and appropriate ways to communicate on social media, which is very, mm -hmm. very important. Because um, unfortunately, we are aware of bullying that does occur, uh, mostly through our mm -hmm. younger children, not so much a high schoolers, but I've also seen unfortunate cases of social media bullying, which mm. is something that's present. Um, and we mm. may not realize it, that our child is engaged in that um, or is fallen victim to it. And so it's just really important to have open lines of communication. And I do my best to encourage that with my families all the time, um, whether it's when the parent is in the room or after they've stepped out. Mm -hmm. So that it sounds like you might be in favor of having high schoolers do their homework or, you know, spend time in places in the home where other people are. So yes. the kitchen, the family room. Sure, definitely. And, and that can definitely help. But I know that there are some children, as I was myself, mm -hmm. I had to go in a very quiet place and not have anything going on. To do your work. Um, to do the work. Mm -hmm. And that may be how that child focuses. But then let's come out of the room. Let's have some engagement with a family. Mm -hmm. Let's have some screen-free time mm -hmm. um, and even some screen-free places. I've got some families who their bedrooms after a certain time, screens are off. Mm -hmm. And actually their screens are charging in parents' rooms. Um, so that's super if yeah. we can have that going. Right. Um, because it's not that I don't want them to have fun and enjoy and be mm -hmm. active on social media, um, but looking at that screen keeps their brains um, communicating. Their, their brain cells are still acting, and sure. they need to have some quiet time. Some downtime. And some downtime mm -hmm. to really um, get the proper sleep. Sure. That makes perfect sense. And so how do you feel about family dinners? It, particularly during the hectic school year where there's homework and extracurriculars yeah. going on and parents might be working. Right. and Family dinners are ideal. Um, they're really important. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was a young girl, we had family dinners all the time. And even then in my house, my mom was like, no one answers the phone. Mm -hmm. And my father had his work set aside and my sister and I were at the table. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage that as well. And I understand that sometimes it may not always happen. Mm -hmm. So let's do the best that we can. Mm -hmm. That's what I ask of my families. Yes, there's things that are ideal. But in the end, if trying to fit into that mold is going to cause more stress to the family, then let's do the best that we can. Mm -hmm. What we're trying for is at dinner time, you all sit down together and you talk. Try mm -hmm. not to answer that phone. Try to put your laptop aside mm -hmm. and try to just find out how the day went across the board. Mm -hmm. And if it ends up that it's just mother and son because dad doesn't get home until much later and daughter has a late game and won't get home, then let it be that way. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to work? Because in the end, causing more stress is not what we want to do. Um, right. You know, we, we want to help relieve that. Right. So, yeah. 
I know of a family where, for the most part, family dinners are next to impossible for them, just given their family di their family schedules. Mm -hmm. So what they've started to do instead are family breakfasts, mm. um, where they gather together as a family, you know, before everybody heads off for the day, mm. and um, they kind of treat that as their that's great. Family time. I think that's great. It's some kind of family time. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's, it goes back to you do what you got to do, mm -hmm. and you still do it right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that's great. great. Good, good. So, these tips are great with back to school coming up. Um, can we talk a little bit about mental health? It's sure. a very important topic yes. in this community and every community. Um, so. What should parents, caregivers do if they suspect that there might be some mental health issues going on with a child? Mm. Ideally, talk to your child, really. But it may not be that easy. Mm -hmm. um, they may not know what they're feeling. If it's a younger child, they may tell you, I I'm fine, I don't, or I don't know what I'm feeling, but I don't think it's sadness. Talk them through mm -hmm. it. Um, engage in the teachers at the school. Um, if they're comfortable, if you know there's somebody that they're comfortable with, ask mm -hmm. them a question, send them an email, um, or speak with them face to face and say, hey, I've been noticing something different mm -hmm. with my child. Um, can you, can we talk about it? Or do you see this as well? Um, that's one option. Mm -hmm. Also, you're a pediatrician. That's what we're here for. You know, I get phone calls all the time. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk? I th I'm a little concerned. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what this is. It's okay. Let's try to figure it out. Let's bring them in and let's see what's going on and we'll get the help that we can get if needed. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And there are some really important resources in the community to yes. help children yes. and teens who might be suffering. Definitely, there are, there are. And your pediatrician will be able to share um, resources with you. Good, good. They're not alone. No, not at all. Good. So, Getting back to you, yeah. <laughs> one of the fascinating things about your bio that is on Emerson's website mm -hmm. is that you served some time in the Army in Afghanistan. I did, yeah. yeah. Can you share a story about that or sure. tell us a little bit about what you were doing there? Sure. So um, what led to that is um, for medical school, I accepted the military scholarship. Um, and so then mm. therefore, when it came time for graduation, I um, went to the military for residency mm. uh, where I was in San Antonio. Um, and then as my first duty station, um, we got to pick, you know, or request where we'd like to go. Okay. Um, and our first choice, um, I sat down with my husband at that time and I said, what, this is what's available. Mm. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Um, because I had to pick a place where also he could work. Sure. Um, so our first place was taken, and our second choice was um, actually Germany. Okay. And I got a call, said, look, you can't do your first, but your second's available. Huh. So I got a hold of my husband. I said, look, what do you think? I got to call him back. Um, and we went with it. So we got to Germany in um, 08. Okay. Um, and on a base there? On a base at Heidelberg. Yes, okay. So we were stationed in Heidelberg. We lived outside of base. Um, wow. And in 09, I got orders to um, deploy to Afghanistan. Wow. So I was there as a pediatrician, an army pediatrician for six mm -hmm. months. Um, I had a great team out there, a great team of adult physicians, family practice docs, internal mm -hmm. medicine docs, trauma surgeons from all over the US. Mm -hmm. uh, because as a general pediatrician, working on a military base in Afghanistan, where yes, unfortunately I did see some children, but a lot of what I saw was some adults I was at least four years out from even learning about adults, <laughs> yeah. if not more. So um, they were great and helped me through that process. Um, and then, you know, had some pediatric cases that, you know, I had witnessed um, and that huh. I was involved with. Some were great, some were amazing stories where yeah. I would see a child who had a um, wound um, from, from the war huh. and was cared for by our neurologists and our neurosurgeons who had at that time already left and there were a new neurosurgical team on board, but the child kept coming back to us for follow-up. So I got to see this kid in follow-up, which was amazing. Wow. Um, and then, you know, there was unfortunately some sad things that I saw too, which still kind of sticks with me. But I think that helped me become who I am today. I really feel that six months that I spent out there taught me a lot about myself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, it, was, it was a great experience. Wow. Yeah. They were lucky to have you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> So, um, 
Can you share maybe another fun fact about you that may influence how you work with children and families every day? To be honest, I'm just, I'm a kid at heart. <laughs> I, I just You am. like the bubbles, don't you? I love you? the bubbles. Oh, I love the bubbles. <laughs> Give me a set and I'll go crazy. Um, I, I really love just getting down on the ground and talking to them. Um, I'll have some families who say, oh, let me put him up in the exam time. I was like, no, he's playing. He's fine. I'll squat. I got to work my thighs. It's okay. <laughs> I just, I really love what I do. Um, and there'll be days that are hard for many different reasons. Mm -hmm. But I walk into that room and I see that kiddo who just smiles or who's now started talking and has learned to say my name. Um, like I've got one patient who for a while couldn't say Bakshi, so she would say, it's Dr. Sheep. Loved it. <laughs> Loved it. Now she can say my name properly, but I still chuckle when I think about that. So I think just the fact that I love what I do and I feel more young at heart with them mm -hmm. and I feel like I relive some of my own youth as well as my young parenthood when I spend time with the families. Mm -hmm. I think mean, that's what it is about me, that molds what I do with them. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. This is so really awesome. so enlightening. It was a Appreciate pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.